All right, guys, welcome back. Today with me, Ted Bezemer uh, from Axio Training. So this is something we just started using in our clinic and in our gym. Uh, I myself have been having uh, some shoulder issues, which I don't even know how they happened. I woke up one day, was fine, and then went to overhead press, and I wasn't fine. So uh, I've seen Axio, the Axio Trainer online over the past couple of years, and uh, you see it, you know, these MLB guys are using it now. A lot of pitchers, guys on the NFL are starting to use it. And I, it popped up on my page a few weeks ago and I was like, you know, uh, we just need to, we need to buy one of these things. It'll be a cool additional tool for rehab, for training, for injury prevention type stuff, especially where we're seeing a lot of weightlifters, powerlifters, stuff like that. And everyone could use a stronger rotator cuff. So, um, we, we just, Tag Ted here in, uh, at Axio, and you know we just started chatting, and was like, "Hey, let's get on the podcast." So, Ted, thanks for coming on today. I, hey, my uh, pleasure. I I really appreciate it. So, uh, for those of you that don't know what the Axio Trainer is, it is this little circular. We have the green one, so it's this little green circular trainer, and it's got a little metal ball in it, and you hold a handle in the middle, and you basically it looks very simple, and um, <laughs> When you when you start to use it, you gotta get it, gotta get the ball moving. But you're the one creating the force, so um, it's something that requires quite a great bit of shoulder stabilization, neuromuscular activation, and coordination, um, and core control, and everything else to keep yourself in one place and not let this thing ruin you. And uh, <laughs> for me, right off the bat, you know, and and you see it and you get it a lot and on the rehab side of things is you go do your banded external rotations, internal rotations, um, some, you know, the body blade is kind of the old school uh, thing where you're kind of shuffling that around back and forth, kind mm -hmm. of punching forward, back, side to side, what have you. And uh, mm -hmm. this is just a completely different tool. It's, it's really upped my rehab with my shoulder and uh, it's only been a few weeks and I went from staggering about maybe 50% of like shoulder range of motion that wasn't painful to I'm at about like 95 now. So it's the last little bit, but I've also fallen off the wagon a little bit with some of my travel and stuff for work too. But how did you get started with this, Ted? What, what made you, I want to know how you figured out how to make this thing and, and how many <laughs> renditions it took, but um, what inspired oh. this for you? Uh, well, you know, basically a pretty bad injury to be honest with you. So, uh, I, uh, injured myself playing hockey, um, dislocated my shoulder, tore my rotator cuff and uh, labrum. Uh, I was fortunate. I got it back in pretty quickly. So like no neurological damage. And I was in my facility the next day and I was like, all right, don't dislocate again. Let's see if I can kind of build this thing up. I wanted to get back into some resistance training and obviously want to get strong and I uh, wanted to get back to throwing a football and baseball with my son and stuff like that. And, and of course, return to hockey. And uh, ironically, you mentioned like a blade. I had a body blade in my hand and I just kind of was using that. And I've been a, I've been a physical therapist and strength coach for as long as body blades been around. So um, I have it in my clinic. I use it every once in a while, but I never, um, never thought I'd need it, I guess, or that I'd be using it. But uh, I had that and I kind of felt, you know, this is just not enough resistance um, to really get strong and, uh, certainly not enough neuromuscular benefit to really stabilize a shoulder, um, of the most mobile joint in the body, basically, right. Uh, for high level function and performance. And so I wanted something that was going to be kind of, uh, a lot more uh, strenuous and much more challenging to control and, and manage. And that's when I came up with the idea of using a rotational resistance, um, one, because the shoulder is such a shallow joint, you know, it looks like a basketball on a pie pan. So if I could get 360 degrees of force around that joint, I could get every rotator cuff muscle to work, um, not just co-contracting, but really more importantly to have ideal shoulder function, we need the muscles to kind of play more like an orchestra and they need to coordinate their tension to centralize that humeral head, especially with high level, you know, movement and, and, and high velocity movements and things like that. So, um, so quite a few renditions, um, boy, uh, I can't even think of how many times I've, how many different things I, I use to try to make it. Um, and eventually I figured it out, um, after quite a lot of failures and, uh, and it saved me from a major, you know, bank art repair. And, and, uh, I've also separated my shoulder many times. I tend to hit people with a shoulder when I play hockey. So, um, survive that. And honestly, like I've, 
can throw a football over 40 yards and no problem at all. And I can, I'm not limited at all. And so it works great. And then uh, I really wasn't going to make it and manufacture it. I just had prototypes and I had people in my facility who'd be like, Hey, Ted, can I use your thing? Didn't have a name. And they'd pick it up and they'd be spinning it and they'd be doing like two handed stuff and squatting and going overhead with it. And, and ironically, many of these people were even just kind of fitness enthusiasts. They weren't even high level athletes. And they were like, this is awesome. I love it. You know, I can do it with my core. They're getting their heart rate up. They're like, it's like an interval trainer. It's like an ergometer. It's, it's like they're, and I was like, kind of like, wow, you know, maybe, maybe there's more to this than just helping shoulders. And so that's really why I made it because I thought it would, it would be something that would benefit a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And um, ironically, since we, we made it and figured out the best way to do it, if anything, it's actually evolved more as I get more coaches and more trainers and physical therapists and athletes using it where there's so many ways we're using this now that I never even thought of. <laughs> like, cause I mean, I was just thinking shoulder and, you know, and, and uh, now it's, it's even being used in like neuro rehab and like with post concussion stuff and all sorts of like lower extremity stuff, core stuff. There's so many ways to use it because now there's so many great minds who are kind of playing with it. And Hey, if you tried it this way and, and uh, which is really kind of fun for me to, in my career to watch, to be a part and, and collaborate with people and watch it kind of grow and, and kind of, you know, meeting people like yourself who like I never would have met if it wasn't for something like this. So it's, it's, uh, it's really been kind of fun and, and very energizing for me in a lot of ways. So uh, who knows where it'll go, I guess, but um, it's, it's going pretty great right now. You know, I'd, I'd love to see what the first rendition of it looked like. Is this something you were like <laughs> trying to just put together in your garage or something? <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, you're, you're exactly right. Exactly where, um, so it's funny. I think I have a post, I did a post a while back on Instagram showing like some of the renditions. And I think the first one was a, uh, it was literally like a vacuum hose kind of thing that I kind of clamped together. And, uh, and so, and, and the funny thing is like, you'd rip it and it, it'd work, I guess, but it, it didn't work right because there's a, you're an engineering background. There's a stress riser there in the system. So when you start to move a mass around this system. This thing's trying to pull it out of your hand. So it's, it's creating a, a force that's trying to open the system. Well, when you have a clamp system and you have a mass that's moving with velocity that's trying to push it open, you can guess what happens when someone really does it hard enough. And uh, <laughs> funny thing, funny thing in my, in, my, in my gym, I remember this, I was doing like a training class for ski training and we had someone using it for something. And we, I think we were chopping with it or something like that. And it was like, you know, one, two, and then all of a sudden, Whoop, and the thing like popped open and like three <laughs> steel masses went like flying across the gym. Fortunately, didn't like take any lights out or like take anybody out in the head. Otherwise that would have been the end of uh, Axial before it started. But, um, but I was just like, Oh shit. I was like, Oh crap. All right. We gotta, we gotta solve this. This is a mechanic. We we, this is a, yeah, this is a flaw in the design. We're going to pick, we're going to make this thing. And so, uh, but yeah, I made them, I made them out of a whole bunch of different things. And, and really the, 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 the reason why it's really so, um, kind of potent even though it looks kind of harmless is because this is uh this patented outer shell is pliable so it actually as the mass rotates it actually teardrops and there's some cool slow motion video where you'll see the mass is stretching the rubber component and it decelerates so to your point you have to drive it you have to really you got to kind of keep going to get it to keep going it won't just go on its own in fact it'll stop on its own so that deceleration that resistance that angular resistance is really what makes a three pound axio basically buckle, you know, 220 pound athletes, you know, it, it's, it doesn't take long. And then of course, if you increase the velocity of it, that you're just, you know, it, it'll punch you back as hard as you punch it basically. So, um, so yeah, this is uh it's like I said, it's, <laughs> it's fun to watch how people pick it up and who figures it out, how long it takes people to kind of get it dialed in and then how they react when they feel it. Usually you'll see their eyes light up. They're like, Oh, like, oh, shit. Wow. That's, whoa. Wow. That's not what I like. You know, it's kind of like it catches them by surprise, you know, once they feel it, you know? So. Yeah. It, it's definitely something that um, there is a slight learning curve to it. It's like, you, like, definitely. clunk, clunk, clunk. And it's, oh, I yeah. got it. And then, um, yeah. but it's yeah. amazing how much, you know, and, and you can go do banded external rotations, eyes wise, T's. Um, you know, any type of stability stuff. And those can, those aren't bad exercises, but it's amazing mm -hmm. how much of your shoulder you feel in like 15 seconds. Once you figure out how to drive this thing around the right way. And it's yep. like, 
oh, okay, my shoulder warm up is done. I don't need to do anything else now. And yeah. now I'm ready to go. Right. And it, it's pretty cool yeah. to see that, you know, it, you, you reinvented the wheel, essentially. It's, it's just a circle, uh, with, yes. with, what kind of looks like a tire tube around it and a ball inside. But yeah, I yes. mean, you see these guys, it's such a, it's small, it's light, it's portable. Like you see these guys in the MLB use it now and it's like, it's an easy thing to just throw in your gym bag too and take wherever you want. Um, and so I might yep. have to buy my own personal one because everyone likes it in the gym so much now. And um, <laughs> interesting, you said though, another cool point was you said uh, before this was uh, you never intended it for it to be a rehab tool. Uh, and right. for me, when I first bought it, I was like, I was looking to use it for rehab. Um, sure. But as soon as I bought it and started using it, I was like, yeah, no, this isn't going to be for everyone in rehab, especially right away. But sure. um so, so what, what was your, your viewpoint on that and, and where you're trying to go with this thing? Yeah. So, uh, so you're exactly right. Um, I didn't want to, I did not want to make a rehab tool. I, I was injured, but I, but I didn't want to be rehabbing. I wanted to be training. I wanted to get back to high level function and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been, I've been a, a PT for a long time and a strength coach for a long time as well. And I kind of always felt like, you know, if you're, we're doing this, we're doing these little band exercises or we're doing a body blade or something like that, or we're doing isometrics or now we're in rehab and then now, okay, now we're out of rehab. Now you can do, now we're going to strength train and we're going to start to load. And so I always felt like there are these like separate rooms that we were kind of hitting, you know, and, and it never made sense to me that why, uh, I mean, I, I guess, look, we get injured, our neuromuscular system starts to deteriorate, fatigue certainly affects that. Um, that's something we want to improve. So rehab is highly concentrated on trying to improve our neuromuscular system. Uh, a lot of manual techniques thing to help that. But I kind of felt like we were oversimplifying really what we needed for high level performance and really injury prevention, to be honest with you. And um, that's what I wanted to basically take a rehab concept, which is something that is a highly proprioceptive, something that requires high level motor control. Um, but then also add in a high level of resistance to it. And like, to your point, Axio is really, it, it, yes, it, it can be used as a rehab tool and there's lots of ways and they're on their website. You can see ways you use it by body position and, and orientation to gravity and things like that can minimize some of the force this will give you. But the truth is, is I wanted the training tool. I wanted something that basically would, would challenge and improve and benefit the highest level athlete or anyone who was aspiring to, to, you know, be better or perform better. And, uh, and that's kind of where it found itself. Um, and then also just a general fitness component to it. This is something that, you know, even though we have a lot of high level athletes using it, um, it's actually got a lot of uh, benefit for just general fitness enthusiasts for whether it be something I get people who use these things around their house, people leave these on their coffee table and they, when a commercial comes on, they spin it sitting down in their chair for, 30 seconds. They put it down. I got people who message me saying, oh yeah, I work from home and I walk around and I get on a conference call and I'm walking around spinning the Axio, you know, and I switch arms <laughs> and, and it's great. And I basically, you know, use it throughout the day and I feel like, you know, so um, like I said, I was intending to fix my shoulder. Um, but then once I decided to manufacture it and really make something that was solid and commercial grade and, and bulletproof, um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted the best athletes and the people who really want to train to validate it, you know, and, and, and identify it as being what it is, which is a high level training tool. And, and uh, I've been fortunate that a lot of athletes really recognize what you mentioned that they feel it like, Whoa, this thing is potent. Like this is different than doing bands. This is, um, I mean, I get people when I go to conferences and, and present it, who will walk up, grab it. I get them over that hump where they start to feel it, as you mentioned, you know, and you learn how to drive it, you know, like jumping rope, they get a feel for it. Then they come back like 20 minutes later and they're like, holy shit, dude, I still feel that in my shoulder. I can't believe how much, I mean, I'd be like 20, like they're shocked at how intense it is. And um, I think that just goes to show you like this thing activates and engages a lot of muscle in the body. Um, obviously the intrinsic, the shoulder very well, every motor cuff muscle, but it gets a lot of stuff going. And I think um, it actually fires up the nervous system, even systemically. I think it has a very uh, amplifying effect and in, in kind of a uh, excitatory, neuroexcitatory benefit. Um, and it just continues to evolve once again, as we get more people using it. So, um, so yeah, like I said, I, I like it to be identified as a training tool that can be used for warm up, recovery and rehab. 
um, not the other way around, not a rehab tool, you know? And I think that that's the challenge with something that looks kind of harmless. I probably should have made it like blood red or camo or something really some spikes you know, industrial. On it. <laughs> something that like, you know, caution stickers or something, yeah. because then maybe people would like, we'll take it a little more. It's like, like, wait a second, you know? Yeah. Um, cause if anything, they, they're surprised when, if they can't do it right away, cause like I said, it looks like it's going to be easy. And then when you can't get it right away, you're like, what the, what, was there some kind of trick to this? You know, yeah. and either they chuck it, they chuck it and get rid of it, or they don't put it down until they get it. It's like one of the two, you know, Yeah, depends on the psychology of the person. What What's really <laughs> cool about it from, and this is from a nerdy, you know, PT standpoint, but you think of, you know, more higher level rehab, especially with throwers, overhead athletes, what have you, when you're doing what we call perturbation. So basically put your arm out in a, at a certain position, you're going to hold there and I'm going to try to slap your arm around and try right. not to move it, right? So that that's kind <laughs> of like for a lot of traditional clinics, that's kind of like the end stage of rehab for some people, right? So that's <laughs> what we would call, you know, stabilization. You're trying to keep your shoulder stable in one position. What's really cool about the Axio is you you can get a sense of that with your you're creating your own perturbation, then you're you're holding in that place, but then you can start adding in all these different dynamics to it too, where you start moving your, your, so you're spinning the, the ball around and you're going through different ranges. Like you could recreate throwing motions, overhead motions, put yourself in different mm-hmm. planes. So I've gotten myself pretty fancy with it now. Uh, but, but I don't really know of any other tool out there like the Axio that can give you all those different stimuluses at once. Yeah. So I love, I love that. Cause I, his, cause and you, and you hit it right in the head. Like, like doing all chain isometrics and rhythmic stabilization stuff. And I still do that in my clinic. And I, when I do patients, I actually use it. I do it early on in my rehab. Yeah. I do it very early and it, and, and I, you know, I might lay them down soup hot, whatever. But um, it, so what, what occurred to me is that like, I feel like when we do those, that technique, I think we're, um, we're giving it more credit than what it really is like the benefits it really provides. And, and here's what I mean by that is that if I tell someone to hold their arm still, don't let me move you what they're doing is their nervous system is now just bracing. So it's just a static hold. There's really not a lot of, mo- it's just a brace and don't let me move you. Don't. Whereas um, uh, Axio, you have to actually drive it. You have to kind of, it's like painting with a brush. You have to really coordinate force to be able to keep it moving and, and work the gas and the brakes versus just bear down and you know lock them up and the truth is like bearing down and locking up is not the same thing as movement and you know it'd be like the argument of like well what's a great stability exercise oh well a plank is a great stability exercise i would say actually a plank's a good strength exercise i don't think there's a lot of stability to a plank at all i think that it's basically static you're not moving you're not having to control force um and i think there's different degrees of stability right that you get from you know i guess holding a baseball versus throwing a baseball or, or, you know, doing a leg extension versus doing a, uh, a lateral rotational lunge or something like that. You know? So, um, I think where Axial really shines is that component of basically not teaching people to brace, but teaching people to coordinate their, their force and coordinate tension the best. And I think, um, where I, I think I see it the most is, and I think every coach has probably seen this with their athletes is that you might get really strong people, who can move a lot of weight, they can deadlift a lot. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm big into strength training, but, uh, but they don't move well. They don't coordinate their force well. They don't sense and uh, anticipate and move well. And true, truthfully, the best athletes and the least injured athletes have that ability. Um, they anticipate well. And, and the better our sensory motor system is, um, not only the better can we coordinate force, but the better we actually anticipate what's happening around us, the better we, we sponge our environment. And, uh, and that's what separates the best athletes from the strongest athletes, to be, to be honest. I think, the, you know, strength is a great metric to have, but, you know, when that bucket's pretty full, you know, working on filling the last little eighth of that bucket isn't going to get you much return when it comes to dodging a tackle on the football field, throwing a football, throwing a baseball, reacting uh, you know, in, in anything that requires a little bit more of a, of a modulation of force, you know, um, I think the best athletes have the best, you know, breaks, to be honest with you, they're able to, to kind of decelerate, accelerate the best. Um, yeah. And like I said, that's what this kind of does, you know? Um, and then of course, 360 degrees is hard to reproduce when you're pushing on someone's arm. So as I'm rotating this around, 
that mass is constantly moving around the system. So the force is always changing. It's, it's variable. It's not predictable like manual techniques or a blade. Um, it's not at 90 degrees to the lever arm. It's, it's constantly changing. And I say, when you get into the heavier ones, it, it literally is trying to pull your arm away from your body. It's really quite uh, dynamic, you know. I'll send you a 720 for sure to play with. <laughs> yeah, it's um, well, it like scientifically too. We know about motor control is so there's these different phases mm-hmm. to motor control for those of you that don't know. But um, the first one would be just stabilization, um, the rhythmic stabilization. So you're you're staying in one place. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we get into this dynamic stabilization later on, and that's really kind of where we see you know rehab really does transfer into strength training because um, now we're talking about you know this can lead you right into doing snatch snatches jerks um any type of overhead movement throwing a baseball that is that dynamic stabilization where yeah you need to know how to hit the brakes um mm-hmm. and that's in, in a lot of sports and good athletes they know how to especially weightlifting and this is where i think this would be a really cool implementation for uh you know USA weightlifting and the sport of weightlifting is it's kind of like golf too, in a sense of like, you have to be really relaxed in certain positions or certain body parts mm-hmm. during certain positions and have certain things really stiff. And then a split second later, they need to be very relaxed to get you into the next position and then turn on with stiffness again, where the mm-hmm. axio is every time that ball moves around, you're constantly reacting to that change in forces and where the ball is and where your, where your extremity might be in time. So that's really cool to see that. Um, and so do you guys have studies on this stuff at all of how it works? <clears throat> um, Working on we it? don't, we, we, well, well, to be honest, I mean, I know, I know what it does scientifically, the physics of it. Um, we haven't done any, uh, like EMG and stuff like that. We almost did early on, um, with uh, university of Utah and stuff like that. And I, and I almost revisited it again, but the truth is those types of studies are really, you know, EMG is not a great way to measure the efficacy of something. It really isn't. And, and uh, like I said, unless there's like aberrant, you know, neural pathways or something like that, maybe it'd show it. But I, I mean, I could basically have like, you know, yeah, I have the EMG chart. I could put on the white lab coat, point to like, look at the signals here and look what this does. But the truth is, is I think it's really a waste of money and resources. It doesn't, um, I don't think it really carries over to that. I think the, um, well, one of the, one of the guys who uh, who really helped me get it into Major League Baseball is a guy named Stephen Thomas, uh, Doctor Stephen Thomas. He's a PhD. He's an athletic trainer. Uh, he is a consultant for the Phillies, and I met with him. This is three years ago, pretty much right when we launched. And uh, he's he's a brilliant guy. I mean, shoulder elbow research specialist. Um, just does tons of studies. Was on Mike Reinhold. I mean, he does. He's he's really great. And uh, he's the head of, uh, I think, uh, a program at Jefferson University now. But um, advisor and consultant to the Phillies. I sent him a few of these, got on the phone with him. And we kind of nerded out, kind of like our <laughs> talk a little bit earlier with some of the components of this. And and, uh, and and Steve was like, you know, like the cool thing about this is that, yeah, as you increase the velocity, the, the perturbation becomes greater. And then if you have multiple masses, each mass has its own force vector. And so it's you really have to now it's like juggling. you got to coordinate this. And so um, I think the challenge behind like determining efficacy of some of these things is is the metric. What's the metric for measuring the neuromuscular system? I would say like it's easy to we got lots of strength metrics. Strength metrics are easy. Like, you know, what do you bench? What do you squat? What do you deadlift? What do you clean? You know, like we can look at these things and we can now start looking at, at force plates and things like that, which is great. Um, and do some 3D stuff. But um you know, the metric for neuro, the neuromuscular system is kind of an interesting one. Like, what is it that we're looking for? I would say this is somewhat of a metric. If I have an athlete, you know, who tests strong in, in, in their, you know, the strength metrics are good and they're like, you know, clunking this thing around or they're falling over on one leg when they're spinning it versus the other leg, they're not. There's a disconnect in the system. There's a, there's a wiring issue there that we can make better. Um, and uh, here's, here's a perfect example of this. And I, and I, I wish I would have gotten video on this. I think I told you, I did uh, talk a while ago at a, at a, at a, a national Academy of sports medicine conference for trainers. And I was up on stage and I was showing trainers how to use this. And there was a, probably about 25 in the room and they all have one of these and they're, I'm having them do this like a two handed move like this, you know, just standing there. And 
and some guys are getting it and some aren't. And, and this one guy's all ripped. He's jacked. I mean, this guy, I don't know what, what his strength metrics were, but he is ripped, full tank top, just caught, you know, chiseled. He's ripping it with both hands. And I'm like, all right, hey, try going into a split stance now. So uh, to your point, changing base of support affects motor control and, and stability. I put him in a split squat. He's ripping it there. I'm like, all right, nice. Let's have you just do a stepping lunge and come out of it while you rotate the axio. Now, I don't know if you've tried that or not, but spinning the axio and lunging seems pretty harmless. It's only three pounds, right? What's the worst thing that can happen is he's going to lose control of the axio, right? Well, this guy goes and spins it, drops into the lunge, and literally falls on the ground. He literally buckles, goes into valgus, collapses, axio hits the floor, and then he's like kind of pulls himself up. And by that time, he probably looks up and sees me pointing at him on stage because I'm like, (laughs) holy shit, that guy just totally control alt deleted like right in front of me. He just blipped, went down and he got up and he's like rubbing the floor with his foot because he was he thought he stepped on like an outlet, like a plug or something or a soft (laughs) spot in the carpet. And there was nothing there. He literally just his nervous system. I mean, something happened where he's rotating. He went just to push out of a lunge and he didn't. He went down. And to me, I think that's, I just remember seeing that and thinking to myself, there's something else that we're maybe missing here. When we talk about like our ACL rehabs and, and we're trying to, we need to develop automaticity. We need to train the nervous system to coordinate tension in one area and move in another. And, and we need to do it just like you talked about when you're snatching heavy weight, your brain's not going through the process mechanically of how you're going to do it. It's actually, it's, it's automatic. It's peripheralized. And that's, one of the sneaky things that this does is it peripheralizes your nervous system. It, we, at first, people are like, wait a second, where's the ball? My brain's highly involved. But the truth is, is that once you feel it and you drive it, it becomes kind of this, it's like playing an instrument. It's not something that you're, okay, what's, how do I do this? You, you, you develop that automaticity. And I think, that's, um, I think that's the kind of the special sauce when it comes to athlete performance. You know, the best athletes, when they're performing their best, they're they all the same thing going through their mind nothing you know mm-hmm. they, they just remember being easy and having fun and and i think that's kind of one of the surprising things that this does that i never of course intended to make it for that reason but i think that's really one of the benefits of what it does for athletes and really everybody for that matter that's really cool and so uh, we we spoke on a little bit but so what it is how did you get into this whole centripetal force rotational (laughs) piece of like, how did you come across that thought? Like what was it about biomechanics and the neuromuscular system that made you think, man, I need a ball inside a rubber tube (laughs) and I need to spin it fast. Didn't start that way. (laughs) So yeah, what happened there? What what was that thought process? And, and why does that, yeah. Why does that work so well for, um, the development of the nervous system for athleticism. Yeah. Well, so I think it was more about me just figuring out something I didn't like, which was the fact the the tools we've been using already that they, I, in the back of my mind is kind of like, you know, this, that really made a ton, a ton of sense to me why we continue to do this, this same, these same linear one direction forces, uh, you know, for the shoulder in particular. And so that was really probably my first thing. I was like, you know, this would be much harder if I could get something that actually, was more resistance, first of all. And then I was like, well, why are we also training the shoulder joint, you know, like such a shallow joint with a one direction force? It'd be better if I could train it in 360 degrees. That'd be, that'd be fun. Um, and then, uh, so I played around with some different things and uh, rubber was not the first thing I kind of used. I think I used like, some hosing stuff I said, but um, what I kind of learned is that, um, yeah, when you rotate something, it's significantly more potent and there's some science behind that. So when you, uh, if you want to double the speed of a mass in a rotational system, the mass in here, a half pound weight, if I want to double the speed of that, I need to apply over four times the force. And that's just with a frictionless system. So when you take an axia, which is now pliable, that decelerates it, adds an, an internal rotational resistance. It's not like a cat toy where you get the thing going, it was going, it won't buzzsaw on you. Um, it actually decelerates. Now it's more like six times the force to get that thing to double in speed. Now, um, so they say it makes something very potent and, and very strenuous, surprisingly strenuous. And so um, plus, once again, 360 degrees of force versus maybe just relying on gravity 
or the force of a band in one plane. Um, it doesn't matter if I do diagonal patterns, PNF, all that kind of stuff. That still is really one direction. It's the band direction is gravity. Um, Axial is affected by both. It's affected by rotational resistance, depending on where the mass is and the velocity of the mass. And it's affected by gravity. So if I want to make it more strenuous, well, I'll hold it out against gravity. If I want to make it easier, I could bend my arm, change the lever arm, make it shorter. It's easier that way. If I change the orientation of it, though, then I'm actually affecting the effect of the mass against gravity. So in this orientation, it doesn't, it's not as strenuous as if I held it like this or like this. You know, um, so there's all these little permutations in the in the, you know, the person, the, the therapist, the strength coach, uh, the engineer the, who can piece together. Hey, wait a second. If I use it in this orientation, now it changes the force and and it changes how it affects maybe my legs or my shoulder or my core. Um, and so it's um, it's great just to basically use it with one arm. But the truth is there are there's so many, so many other ways you can integrate this in training. It's really endless, and it just comes down to really who the chef is, as far as uh, you know how you use it. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm excited. I gotta go back and look at some of the other exercises and, and options I have to do, and even like you said, like um, you know, treating ankle sprains and stuff with this mm -hmm. uh, is something because you know far too many people we still see standing on an ARX pad or a Bosu ball, you know, mm -hmm. doing something. It's like, look you know, unless you're training to outrun an earthquake, this isn't real life <laughs> application. There's no skill, uh, transition of skill to real life and in, in modern patterns, but mm -hmm. having that ankle on solid ground and then having your upper body move around it, that's a whole different reverse pattern of much more applicable to real life. So, um, you know, you could throw Agreed. a ball to someone too, but again, that just continuous time under tension definitely probably has some major um, effects to improving ligament, you know, tendon quality and everything else too. So I think, yeah, that would be the interesting research actually probably would be to look at maybe tendons and how it affects, you know, tendon ligament stability, things like that. That might be kind of interesting. Yeah. Even looking at, and I don't know how well you could test it, right. Cause it's like, there's the warm up effect and everything too, but mm -hmm. yeah, we see so many like gymnasts, everything else, super mobile people that have a lot of, um, you know, passive range of motion, but actively have no idea to tap into uh, sometimes a fair amount of that. And then to see what happens if you gave them one of these things, have them start, you know, messing around in, in kind of their strike zone of their neutral range to getting them mm -hmm. towards those end ranges and then see what a post test mm -hmm. looks like. That would even be interesting. So, okay, now, now we have active motor control in these these ranges that would even be a, a probably pretty simple study to look at. I, I like that. I think that's actually, I think that's really insightful. I like that because um, like with our baseball players, for example, everyone's trying to create more lag, you know, weighted balls or trying to create more, more end range ER throw harder and things like that. And so, um, so one of the ways that we use the Axio is, is actually putting them in full end range ER and all long, I'll do a long axis move. I don't, most people think it needs to look like a throwing motion. They need to be at 90, 90 for some reason. But the truth is that's not really the best way to train the shoulder. If I put them out here in ER and supination, I can rotate an axio here oh. and I can get them to, uh, to own. So, so the, the expression you, you nailed it is that you, you basically are getting someone to own their range. You're, you're imprinting their range. And I think the way you imprint it, you know, I think like the FRC stuff has helped with this a lot. Um, you know, you're owning, you're, you're actively holding in the end range, which is great, but it's, it's better to dynamically load in the end range. It's better to develop the motor control and coordination at the end range, not just, you know, I think I saw a video once of like one guy just doing someone against the wall and he has them at basically they're at 90, 90 and they lift their form off the wall and they hold there. And he's talking about you know, dynamic rails. stability, end range, dynamic stability. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's just not dynamic. You're just having to hold. That's just active range of motion is what that is. And even gravity minimized for that matter. Um, I mean, even if you lay on your stomach and do it, okay, great. There's active range of motion against the force of gravity holding there. I like it. I think it's, it's a good. Start. I think it makes people, it's a good place to go. But now when you put an Axio in someone's hand and you wrote it there, now what you're doing is you're training that end range with a very, you know, uh, nutritious uh, <laughs> nervous system activation. Um, and I think, like I say, it's just the degrees of stability. You know, you got your plank, you got your active isometric holds in end range, 
And then you've got an Axio, you know, which is like pouring gas on it. Um, and so I think that's really where I'd like to see if, if I see someone who can handle end range ER of a thrower and they're rotating an Axio and they're fully supinating and they're hanging out back there and they can maintain that. Not only are they imprinting to the nervous system that they own that position, um, you're also not going to have any adverse effect on the anterior capsule. Um, you're not going to stretch the anterior capsule, which you might get with some weighted ball throwing and things like that. So it's very safe on the shoulder. Um, it's, um, I, I think it actually does even more than that. I think it actually will give them that chance to have more dynamic control in that range, um, which I think is really what we want to have. It's not just holding a position. It's being able to move in and out of it be able to, you know, write calligraphy in that position versus writing block letters, you know, that kind of analogy. Doing that with a supinated, externally rotated grip sounds miserable. I have yet to try that. Although I did start doing it, You'll get it. Uh, on my belly and prone, and that is Ooh, gnarly. That's evil. Uh, yeah. It is evil. <laughs> uh, and non-dominant arm some... too. Go non-dominant. I did. Yeah. I did. That's it's tough. Okay, good. It, it doesn't look as good as the right side, but it's, it's there. It can move. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's trainable. Um, yeah. And so as far as injuries go, like there's probably plenty of guys that are back to training, have some of these nagging things that, you know, have stuck around for a long time. What types of shoulder injuries do you see this thing helping with besides, you know, maybe all of them? Uh, <laughs> Cause the goal is <laughs> what you're trying to get yeah. back to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because like I had people, like I said, I didn't want to make a rehab tool and it's like I said, it's not a rehab tool, but I have physical therapists that reach me who are like interested in it. So I eventually finally put together videos and exercises and I have a rehab page on there in ways that progressions and regressions of how you might use it with shoulders, ankles, knees, core, you know, back stuff, just to show some people some examples of how they can integrate it with quite often things that they might already be doing, to be honest with you. Um, and then so the thought was, well, you need to have a, uh, you need to have a rotator cuff protocol. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, I mean, you treat, I've treated, I don't know how many rotator cuff patients I've treated over the years, but I've treated a lot of rotator cuffs. And the first thing you learn about treating a lot of rotator cuffs is they're never the same. And it's always kind of a little bit different. Everyone's a little different what someone (laughs) tolerates. And, and so I always like felt like, you know, well, the last thing I would want to do is give somebody a cookie cutter program and say, this is the way you do it. And, and because I think it's something that the therapist is really the one who has to determine that that's where the expertise comes in. Versus just giving a program and they'll be fine on their own. I mean, I think I think I certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for messing someone up because I gave them you know bad advice without ever seeing them. You know, but um, but I think to your point, it, it actually uh, <laughs> I don't know if I could think of a shoulder injury that actually it doesn't work well with. Um, it just depends on where they are in their recovery. So if you're looking at like a rotator cuff patient, I won't bust an axio out until they're at least six weeks post op. I don't want to do anything that's going to stretch that repair. Um, I won't pendulum with a, with a weight. I don't do any of that because all it takes is just someone to basically have it let go a little bit. And then you got a super weak shoulder for them to deal with. And, and, uh, and so I burst, I kind of feel like there's nothing, there's more things you can do wrong in the first six weeks than, than help them be further along in the first six weeks, you know? So, uh, but I do, uh, use it after that and I'll, I'll basically use the change in like the orientation of gravity. So for example, um, Actually, not even a rotator cuff. I had a guy who had a uh, glenoid uh, cartilage fissure, a young baseball pitcher or catcher, uh, landed on his shoulder skiing, messed up his shoulder, young kid, probably 17, 18 years old. And uh, after six weeks, he's doing pendulums with an Axio. So he's bent over and he's spinning the Axio though. So it's not just, I mean, that lights up your cuff with a low grade traction. It's very safe, a little tricky to get going because you got to feel where that mass is. And so sometimes it takes a little bit of a push start. But um, really actually great for pain, great for range of motion. Um, they said patients tolerate it great, and it wakes up all the muscles in the rotator cuff at the same time. Um, so I like that. Then I might put them in supine on their back. So now I'm having gravity still. Now gravity's loading you know, down my humerus. It's not me holding the weight up. That's a different move there, and I can work on more, more protraction stuff. Uh, but I still, once again, don't get the weight of gravity, which might make someone start to do all that scapular elevation stuff I don't want to see. And then I would progress into like two-handed stuff, one-handed stuff, and change lever arm and things like that. And eventually, they'll rotate it, you know. Um, but that would just be like a progression, just picturing it through. And that's all on the website, you know, um, on how like you might just change the orientation of the Axio. 
to uh, to progress resistance or uh, or you know neuromuscular challenge. Um, you know, interestingly, and you know, talking about the study, and I and I, I really should have uh, I never actually documented this, but I probably should have. I had a guy who had a rotator cuff uh, tear. He's an older guy, and he'd pick up a he if he just picked up the axial or a three pound weight, he'd get pain raising his arm, get that kind of painful arc, you know, not too much of a shoulder shrug, but he had a, he had a, a partial thickness there of a supraspinatus. He'd get pain. He takes an axio, spins it, raises his arm all the way oh, up yeah. and lowers it down and has no pain at all. Mm -hmm. Like to me, like that's, there's your, that really is the proof that, right. That's all I would need as a therapist or someone to and understand. Like clearly if I, if I can recruit more of the cuff, you know, then I can kind of compensate for that tear and maybe some of the weakness in the supraspinatus, and I get that humeral head to not ride up and, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and I, like I said, it worked, it worked. So now it might not work for everybody, but, <laughs> but I yeah. watched it and, and that kind of tells you right there that, you know, maybe it's not, you know, just the linear band stuff and weights that we, you know, should only be doing, you know? I, I, I gotta say, I commend you for your, um, altruistic uh and just being a good person about this but you're missing out on a ton of money because i just had someone the other day come into my clinic that's he's he's a training <laughs> client and he's doing some pt with us right now but um he got the crossover symmetry bands and mm -hmm. I, i've i've seen them through crossfit and stuff and i was mm -hmm. like it's just one set that there's two bands they're rubber bands with the little like coil thing so that if they snap you don't fall over uh or they go and fly off and hurt someone but I go, yeah, mm -hmm. what'd you pay for those? He's like, oh, they were like $111 or something. I said, what? Mm -hmm. I go, I have the same bands on the on the thing over here that I paid like $10 for. He's like, well, I bought it for the program. I go, you bought it for the, you know, yeah. the little poster with the 12 exercises on it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you reverse up. fly or reverse fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah reverse fly up, yeah. reverse fly down. Whatever. Yeah. I was like, all right, whatever, man. <laughs> it's your money. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, but, I get you. I mean, uh, I've, you know, not I'm not saying it's the right thing that. to do. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, like, I mean, so, so, I, so, like I said, I, I do take, I do take my profession seriously, um, and and uh, to the point where, like, you know, I get people who ask me to, like, you know, you know, in like MLM companies to sell their nutritional products and all sorts of stuff, and yeah. and to me, like, I think you know, the responsibility of, of a licensed healthcare provider is is. Uh, is to always try to uh, provide the best education, the best resources to your clients, and your patients, and um, and, no and the truth is, like everything on the website is is free. It comes with the product, so like yeah. you get the actual, you get the entire database of, that we continue to add to it. I don't, um, you know, I, I like like I said, I think it's uh, even then people still don't necessarily look for it. By the way, <laughs> I should point out, like we got yeah. hundreds of exercises on the website and a rehab page and all sorts of stuff, but then. All of a sudden, I let someone know we got it, and they're like, "Are you kidding me? I didn't know that was there." <laughs> so like, well, yeah. you scan the card when you got the product. <laughs> you know, no, so, that, that, uh, that's that's very respectable, though. That you, um, like you say, it's an understanding of the therapist of, you know, there's a certain place and time to start using it, how to use it, when to use it, and that's not black and white. And and there's too many fitness companies out uh, there that are, yeah, just this is how everyone should do it, and it's like how the fuck yeah. does this work? Um, I, there's no way yeah. that's, that's possible. No uh, one's happy. You, yeah. No, it doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, so crossover symmetry is going to fix everyone with this one same protocol that everyone's going to do for different, you know, a hundred different shoulder injuries. I don't, you know, it could probably help, but it might not be the best. So um, I commend you on that. Thanks. Yeah. And so uh, where's this thing going with the NFL and the MLB? Like what, what things are, are they seeing it, its utility in and are they just doing prevention with it? Are they doing it? What are they doing with it? And what are they seeing from the benefits of it? Um, well, so, so MLB is, uh, is by far our biggest, um, I guess, professional sports client. So we probably have every, I think we have every MLB organization now uses these in some capacity. Um, many travel with them, obviously, because they're super small. They can throw 12 in a bag. Um, it's definitely identified in baseball first and foremost, I think as a warm up tool by athletes, because baseball players are always, they're, they're naturally been kind of fed the idea of arm care and warming up and stuff like that. And so it's a pretty quick, potent way to, 
to warm up uh, the rotator cuff, the shoulder blade muscles, the core, um, kind of amp the nervous system a little bit, excite the nervous system as well. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely used for that. But like I said, uh, training is the other piece. So um, uh, well, it was kind of cool. I, I presented at um, MLB, um, it went, MLB winter meetings in San Diego back in uh, just a couple months ago in December um, to all the, every team's athletic trainer. And, uh, and it was really kind of fun because now that Axio has been out for a few years, uh, I mean, COVID kind of messed things up a little bit, but uh, I've had teams uh, like the Rockies, for example, have about 25 of these. The Diamondbacks have a bunch of these. The Padres, Padres order a bunch before they go on road trips to, you know, get more for their trips and stuff. So it, it's kind of cool to see now and meet with the trainers who have been using them. And, uh, and it's kind of neat because now, uh, like the Padres, I was just super psyched about this because the Padres are actually hooking up bands to it. And like, so on our website, there's a whole bunch of ways you can hook bands up to create different force vectors, protraction, upward scapular rotation, horizontal abduction. Like, I mean, you can keep kind of building these levels to it. And, um, and the Padres, I'm like, you guys are hooking bands up to this, right? And, the, and the, one of the, he's a PT and strength coach. He's like, he's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So, uh, so like you know, I said, from a training standpoint, like I love hearing that kind of stuff where people are, oh yeah, we're, we are strength coaches. We're, we're deadlifting and then we're dropping in. We're doing side plank arm bars for 30 seconds with the Axio each side. Then we go back to the bar and deadlift and we, we work it into our programming in that way. And I'm like, ah, oh, that is what I love because that's basically a coach running with it and, and building it and working it into their programming versus, oh, I'm just going to do this for 30 seconds before I go lift, you know? And I think that's, uh, like I said, that's awesome. And so um, recently uh, we just got in with, uh, with some quarterback uh, coaches in Southern California that, uh, you know, I kind of, they were interested in it. And I was like, Hey, I'll send you a couple samples. Let me know what you think. I think this is a good tool for your quarterbacks to, to be using and uh and they love it they love it they love it because it's challenging to be honest with you they use blades sometimes and they both you know they all kind of felt the same way this is just not strenuous enough it's not dynamic enough quarterbacks need to be able to move their body quickly they need to react it's not a re- constant repeatable throw maybe like a baseball player a pitcher or something like that um and uh and the, the so the feedback's been huge and then we just um I'll be next week. I'll be out at uh, presenting at the NFL Combine to like 120 NFL strength coaches, um, and to me, those are that's like I look forward to events like that because uh, strength coaches, you know, everyone's got their perspective on what's good and what they should be doing, and I think a, a tool like this that looks kind of harmless to be able to to get them to really feel what it does and appreciate, you know, the, how dynamic it is and how they could integrate it and coach it to me is really a really fun, exciting conversation to have. And, and so, uh, um, you know, I'm pretty confident that they'll figure it out and they'll, they'll recognize the value and how they can use it in their training programs, you know? Um, so, and like volleyball and other, I mean, there's other, you know, other sports overhead athletes, you know, we've done a lot of volleyball stuff. Uh, we have some, uh, some ATP tour guys in tennis using it, um, tactical shooting, archery, um, you know, it really, it has a lot of different applications and, and benefits depending on really what the sport is, but obviously overhead athletes are is kind of the first no brainer, you know? I would, I would say it must be probably very beneficial for quarterbacks. These, especially looking at that, like the rate of incidence of like an anterior dislocation being you know, yeah. sacked with their arm up in the, at the start of their UCL, throw. Right? <laughs> UCLs yeah. too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it'd be cool to see what this thing does for them in, in a few years of using it and what adaptations we can find. And, you know, if, if we could certainly find that there's some type of uh, decreased incidence of dislocations and, and, you know, quarterbacks and things would be interesting, but I, I don't see theoretically why we wouldn't see that. So it's uh it's yeah. really cool, man. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I think that, I think like when it comes to certain things, I mean, we've got some, we've got a couple of NHL teams that use them. Um, they integrate them into their like lower body. Like the Boston Bruins have them and they do like rear foot out, like Bulgarians off a bench. Uh, and they drop down and they do low. I mean, because hockey players need to be low. They're doing two handed low split squat, 90 second rotations, spinning it. So basically two handed rotating while you're in that, that low Bulgarian for 90 seconds. And, um, and so what happens is when you're rotating that, that force is going into the ground and then you get a ground reaction force that goes back to the axio and back into the ground. And there's this kind of volley and, uh, it's, um, 
I'll just say it's not pleasant. I gotta try that because uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a hockey it's player. Not my, I'm a hockey player myself, right, and, and a Boston Bruins awesome. fan. So uh, okay, I gotta go do what they're doing. Just is my uh, yeah, my, my yeah. heroes, my childhood heroes over there. Well, so I'm a Sabres fan. I grew up, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So you know we can we can't really can't really get along, but it's all right. Bruins are it, Bruins are pretty incredible this year yeah we're yeah. way better than everyone else this year so <laughs> I, I play i play on a rec team with a bunch of guys from new hampshire and boston and so uh, okay so yeah and i used to live in boston so um yeah no they're 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 pretty filthy good you know yeah um, so yeah i think you know that i think that's a cool way to use it and i think um from like these shoulder and these contact injuries i think for the hockey stuff you know i think look i mean a lot of these injuries happen just from blunt trauma though so i think you know even though i think an axio is a phenomenal training tool as a component to a training program i wouldn't just use axio of course i would be doing things to hypertrophy the shoulder and add as much mass as i can in the, the pronator and and uh i think sometimes you know you can you know having more mass can give you more mechanical stability when it comes to those types of uh, blunt traumas you know yeah. um, i'd say this is especially more of a dynamic stability tool um whereas strength training in general would be more of a mechanical stability tool you know yeah, both both together are definitely needed to to mitigate risk yeah. of injury on the field. Yeah. But um yeah, man, that that's awesome. I mean, there there's so much to this and again, such a simple tool that you invented over here. Uh <laughs> that's just and, and talking talking through it more now too. I'm even like, oh yeah, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of science actually in theory we know about movement behind this. So that's really cool to see mm -hmm. all the different things you can do with the simple little thing. And um, I would say too, for people like that work out not, now that you're telling me all these things, like if you are traveling on the road and you need a quick workout, you bring a three pound, 12 inch little yeah. ring with you, throw it in your bag. You could do a pretty gnarly, you know, hotel, oh, yeah. hotel workout uh, in about 15 minutes, probably with this thing. If that, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah, it's 30. So we do like, I typically do like 30 second intervals. Yeah. So I'll, I'll base it like parameters off of 30 second intervals. I might be like with a client, I might be, okay, look, um, I want you to hold a split squat. I want you just to do one arm, whatever. And I'll say 30 seconds. If you lose control, just get it going again. The clock's still going. And the goal is, can you complete 30 seconds without losing control? Um, now you can also rep it. So you could be like, I'm going to do move it between like, you know, flexion and abduction or something like that. And I'm going to do eight reps or, um, other training stuff that I really like when we're talking about the weight training stuff is, um, supersetting. So I might do like overhead presses and then, and then, and follow up with an axial interval because as we fatigue, our neuromuscular system deteriorates. So we, you know, we, we want to basically continue to challenge that with our, with our endurance. So, um, so I think that's a pretty sneaky way to do it. And then of course, integrating it with other compound lifts and, virtually any core exercise. I mean, bird dog, side planks, bear crawl, um, V seat positions, uh, you know, ab hollows. Uh, I mean, it's, I do tons of thoracic rotation stuff with it. It's, it's it just depends on how, uh, how far down the rabbit hole you want to go with it, I guess. Yeah. I, I do have a question there. So, uh, sure. it's just my perspective on training and what we're trying to get. So, you know, we don't, and it depends on what we're trying to do, what the training effect or stimulus we're going for. But, you know, for my guys that are weightlifters, we're trying, the goal of the sport is lift as much weight overhead as possible, uh, mm -hmm. move it as little as possible and you get under it. So end range mobility, stability, but we need a shitload of shoulder stability, strength. Um, but we also do a lot of work capacity to build on those structures so they don't break down. But you're saying you would mm -hmm. um, like superset the Axio with say overhead pressing or something like that? Yeah, I might. I mean, I wouldn't, if you're trying to basically continue to progress to a, a max, but once you're done, I would drop set it and use it. So, okay. I mean, a lot of certain, like, like any bottoms up, like, like I'm not, I'm not talking about doing like some of the heavy lifts that you might be talking about, but if I were doing like, um, but you certainly could, I guess, but if I'm doing like a bottoms up kettlebell or something like okay. that, or landmine presses or something like that, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll basically drop it and, and uh, almost kind of ring it out, so to speak, because, if you, I guess the argument would be, and you'd see this pretty, pretty obvious, whether, you know, no matter how, I guess how you're doing it, but if someone is fatigued, you're going to see them clunk this thing around a shit ton more than if they're not. Mm -hmm. And so um, now if I want to really improve the nervous system, you know, uh, I want to improve my free throw shooting, you know, 
or, or picking corners and I'm shooting a, a puck or something like that. Well, I'm better off training that system when I'm fresh, right? Not exhausting myself. Don't go in the gym and do a shit ton of curls and then start shooting free throws because you're probably going to mess with your form, your technique. You won't actually get that neuromuscular pathway down. So in early stage, I think that's important to probably not do. But I think once you get to a certain point to, you know, there, there might be some benefits to breakthrough plateaus with lifts where you start to integrate more of a neuromuscular challenge um, after a lift. And then you now the question would be, and this would be, you know, um, kind of the hypothesis is that if when you go back to that lift the next time you train, is it going to be better? <laughs> or you know, I don't think it would happen right away necessarily. Maybe it would because of maybe some neurofacilatory benefits. Um, this does, in, this does, it's neuroexcitatory. So when you spin this thing, it's not just warming things up and activating. It's actually getting your nervous system, getting your wiring, maybe a little bit more, um, ready to pop, so to speak. Um, so like we have done some stuff with, uh, a guy who's a power lifter out of, uh, Austin, Texas, who he do, he'd spin the axio. He'd do like a hip box, spin the axio in a hip box. 10 seconds as fast as he can once because he's good at it drops it and then goes right under the bar huh okay and he said it made him feel more connected with his lift now i mean this is one of those things where you know he's a more experienced lifter than i am and so the it's a subjective feeling but the bottom line is if he he feels more connected there's a better chance he's going to perform better so um so yeah i would say play around with that like from a and see what you think you know yeah. Um, you could hypothesize that spinning an axial for 10 to 15 seconds and maybe someone's bat speed, arm speed, club head speed would be higher. Yeah. You but know, we don't want vibration wanna, training can do that. You know, we also, we probably don't, what is like the cutoff there of like, when do we cut <laughs> into now we're going to start to see fatigue on those lifts that are right. supersetted there. Is 100%. It 15 seconds, yep. is it 30 seconds. Don't know. That's that, no, and that's like, and so, like to your point, like the like that's where people are like, well, how long, how many reps should I do for warm up before I go pitch? And I'm like, well, the last thing I want is for someone to noodle their arm and then walk out there you know, with their knuckles dragging on the ground because they use the axial for ten minutes before they throw. Yeah. Um, in in fact, even our RX, we have an axial eight throwers warm up um, that is eight different axial moves, but only four of them actually involve rotating the axial. Some of them are actually doing some different types of things because my concern would be to noodle somebody before they perform, you know, and, yeah. and everyone's different. And so I would say like what, what's, what works best for you with, you know, pr- prior to lifting versus someone else, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's really up to the athlete to kind of figure out what they like and, and go with it, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. Well, um, cool. Anything else you got for us today? No, man. I yeah, see. I appreciate the conversation. It's fun. Fun talking to PTs uh, who also have the art of uh, strength training in their uh, in their toolbox, because uh, I think that's, uh, you know, like for me, it's fun because, you know, PTs typically understand the concept of why this is a good idea. But it's strength coaches who have who actually like the fact that it's challenging and that it needs to be coached and that it benefits from coaching. And so um, I think uh, to your credit in, in, in your, your uh, facilities is that you know, like PTs typically don't like to coach, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unfortunately. And, and, uh, and I think that's, un- that's unfortunate. And the, and the, uh, the way practices are nowadays, and, and fortunately I don't practice in that environment anymore, but it, there's some of these assembly line kind of conveyor belt formats. It, uh, even if a PT wants to coach quite often, they can't. So, um, so like I say, it's more fun for me to, to get this in the hands of people who want to coach and who yeah. want to educate because, uh, that's why it continues to spread and become more popular. And that's why we have some of the best athletes in the world using it now. So like I said, it's, it's not just a compliment to the product. It's a compliment to everybody who's contributed to, to making it better and helping with curriculum development. And, um, and and I'm sure we'll follow up with some conversations, but I welcome, you know, like I said, I love these dialogues, these conversations and stuff because it just makes it better. It it energizes me as a, as a uh, clinician and as a trainer. So I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, where can people find you, Ted, if they want to learn more about the Axio or where can they learn more yeah. about, where can they find the Axio? Axiotraining.com or at Axio Training on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, uh, Twitter, all, all those right. platforms. Axiotraining.com and at Axio Training, A-X-I-O. Cool. Well, that is it for today, everybody. Um, 
Thank you for tuning in. And uh, next time we get up uh, Michael Mullen from the Postural Restoration Institute to talk about breathing and um, some postural stuff, performance and, and adaptations we see with athletes there. So that'll be another good one for us. But uh, Ted, thank you so much for today. It was a great conversation. Uh, learned a lot and uh, just, just a good chat to, to see how much the simple little tool can do for so many people out there. So thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem.